Good afternoon, everyone. It's welcome. <laughs> I'm Mike Stark, AWCI's CEO, and it's my distinct pleasure to moderate this esteemed panel, they made me say that, esteemed panel on ownership transfer. Planning for ownership transition is, is wise and important, but it can also prove to be more difficult than most company owners might expect and take longer to implement. Today we have a panel of AWCI members who are willing to share their experiences. Mark Nabity, to my right, is the CEO of Greyhawk LLC, a 57-year-old wall and ceiling contracting company headquartered in Lexington, Kentucky. Mark is also a past president of AWCI and the 2006 Pinnacle Award winner. Scott Truszynski is COO of the Heartland Companies and has worked in the Des Moines construction market since 1994, all of it as a specialty contractor. Scott is an active member of the AWCI Industry Awards Committee. And representing TJ Wee's Contracting, a commercial wall and ceiling construction firm founded in 1994 in Lake St. Louis, Missouri, are Cameron Weiss, President and Chief Operating Officer, and Tim Weiss, CEO. Cameron is active on the AWCI Emerging Leaders Committee and the Young Executives Forum. Tim is an AWCI past president and the 2019 Pinnacle Award winner, and happy 30th anniversary to TJ Weiss as a company. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. Thank you. There are a number of approaches to ownership transition. The primary goal for the current owners or owner or owners is to preserve the equity he or she has built up in the firm while also providing a path and process for the next owner to be successful and profitable. Today's discussion will look at family succession, owner to owner succession, and transitioning to an ESOP or employee stock ownership plan. Tim and Cameron, can you share how and when you knew you would start planning for ownership transition? Tim, Tim I think we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, it actually started uh, when Cam was a junior in high school, probably. And I'm gonna let him talk about the terms that we talk, discussed uh, at that point. <laughs> uh, well, being in a family business, uh, the, the actual conversation was between my brother and I were the only two siblings. And uh, he was six, I was 16, he was 18, and I asked him, hey, you want anything to do with this construction thing? He said, no, you gotta wake up too early. I said, good, <laughs> don't ever change your mind. That was the last conversation we had on it. Um, but overall, being in the family business, starting at 11 and really only having one job, uh, and TJ Weiss, um, just kind of worked up the ladder. But it was about five or six years ago that we really started having more conversations just to relatively start kind of getting a time frame. Um, one of the things that we did do uh, that really just helped us from a family business side of things was we, we hired uh, one or two consultants to come in. And ultimately what they did is really just get my dad and I to kind of speak the same language. You know, oftentimes we would be saying the exact same thing, maybe in just different words. And uh, it's kind of funny, it would cause some friction, some frustration, but ultimately, uh, they would just kind of sit us down and get us to be better understand what we were really saying was the exact same thing. So that really started quite a bit early, but really kind of got us more aligned, made me understand his vision, made him understand my vision, and then kind of slowly worked, uh, worked on that. Um, a couple years ago, what, what, was, what we did start doing is then he really put all of his uh, items that he does, him solely alone, and like anything, uh, all the ones that he didn't really want to do anymore, I took over. I just kind of slowly <laughs> started that process. So nothing too um, you know, earth shattering, just really just started early and it really started more conversation and really kind of brought in some outside influences just to kind of help grease the wheels. The, uh, the consultant, one of the, the biggest thing that he brought to the table, I thought, uh, once again, Cam was right. A lot of times we'd be talking, to, saying the same thing, just a different language. But what he also brought out the, the point, it, it was, um, I, I've told people, a lot of people, Cam and I are a lot alike in a lot of ways, but in other ways we're diametrically opposed. And I've told people that I, if there is such a thing as coming back again and having a redo, I want to come back as, as his brother and, and do this again because his strengths are my weaknesses, my strengths are his weaknesses. And 
so what the consultant sat us down and said, you know, Tim, it's unfair for you to try to change Cameron and expect Cameron to be Tim the second. Cam is going to be Cam the first. And then he sat down with Cam and said, you don't take all that on your shoulders. You don't have to be Tim the second. You're going to be Cam the first. You've got strengths and, and you've got weaknesses. Your dad had strengths. Your dad has weaknesses. And you build your team around them. So that was, that was a, a big point for both of us in, in the whole situation was understanding that, you know, he doesn't have to be me and he doesn't, and it's unfair for anybody to expect him to be me. Our, our people, our field, our, our staff, they, they need to expect him to be Cam the first, not Tim the second, so. As far as what type of consultant, you don't have to name the consultant, but was this a, a consultant that had worked specifically in the, the construction industry? Was it a financial consultant? All the above, just kind of curious on what type of consultant facilitated it, this for you. It, he, he was a con construction specific consultant, uh, similar to like an FMI, but it was not an FMI. We, we, we deal with them on other situations. But uh, it, it was some that, a gentleman that was recommended by one of our general contractor friends that went through an ownership transition with uh, the dad to two sons. And uh, um, it, was, it was interesting, it, you know, you, I've never been to a psychologist, but I think this is what a psychologist does. Because he'd, we'd, we'd, Cam and I'd just be yammering on, and he'd just sit there and listen. And shoot, the first t couple times, I bet he didn't say 20 words. <laughs> and you wonder, huh, what are we paying for? <laughs> But then, but then it, 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 it worked. And uh, so I'd, I'd highly recommend uh, if anybody is considering doing, going this, this path, it, it does help. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. Mark the first, we'll turn it over to you. We have Tim the second and Cameron the first. Uh, Mark, let's talk about owner to owner succession at Greyhawk. Uh, can you share a bit about the process when you took over at Greyhawk compared to the process you used to help identify a successor? You know, the means and methods that we're doing the ownership transfer are, are very similar, actually the same plan, but it was a real different story. I had worked in our business for eight years, became president of our company, and seven years later started the buyout of Bill Bell that started our company. And um, it was easy because I was already doing the executive management of the business. Bill had kind of just stepped aside, said, give me a few projects to manage, I'm good you take care of all this crap. You know, that was, that was kind of it. But I had, working with him side by side, uh, holding my hand for many years. He was, he was my number one mentor in my business career. And he taught me the ropes and then he stepped aside. So, it took five years for me to buy him out and um, went along 14 years. I start thinking, I'm 59 years old and I'm looking around me and we, we're an old company. We had a lot of 30, 40 year plus employees in our business. And I looked and I thought, there's nobody in this business that's gonna want anything to do with this. We're aging out and I've let that happen. Uh, I've, gotta, I've gotta start planning for it. So eight years ago, I started planning for it. Um, decided that I need to go out and find that person. I need to find somebody kind of a big assignment in our business to take over our drywall side, metal framing, drywall, acoustical, which I consider the toughest piece of our business. I've always kind of dealt with the prefab side, but I hired a guy, I want him to come in from A to Z to run that piece of our business. Um, talked to him about it. He was very experienced in the industry, came from a mega company. Uh, Felt was too big. He was looking for something smaller. He was looking for an opportunity to get ownership. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a guy to come in and prove that he could do that. And if he proved it, he was gonna get that opportunity. So we came to an agreement and he came in and he did that and he's doing it to this day. He's done a wonderful job. Um, 
So we went three years to kind of feel him out, and then we started putting a, a plan together um, to do the transition, and it's, it's working like clockwork. Outstanding. You, you hit on something which I think is interesting where you, know, you had long-term employees, which only speaks to outstanding culture uh, to have you know, employees there 20, 30, even 40 years, but then it created a bit of an issue because everyone was maybe past the point of, of being willing or having a desire to take over the company. Right. Um, so, you know, a, a positive to have, have that longevity with your team, but then you had to, you had to go out and really find your successor because it, it wasn't there on the surface internally. Right. Uh, during the ownership transition process, Mark, you know, how can a company ensure a smooth transition and acceptance of a new owner leader? I mean, it's a time of, of certainly, uh, I don't care how smooth it is, I would imagine uncertainty with your team. You know, some are in the loop, most probably aren't in, in those kind of uh, important transition conversations, but trying to ensure a smooth transition so either people don't, don't leave because of the uncertainty or they're just uh, uneasy with the changes that are happening. I, th I think we wanted to be real transparent with our employees, uh, get this right out in front of them from the get-go. We didn't leave it as a question. It was a, it was a bold statement. This is the guy that's taken over for me. We're going to put a plan together, um, and we're going to make it work. And, and the old-time employees, that was really important because they're not, they're not ignorant. They see that I'm aging, and, you know, what's the future? Is he going to close the doors and walk away? What's he going to do? So this gave them some peace of mind, um, but we've been very vocal and very transparent about it, and that, that's helped a lot. I'm sure that goes a long way, because you, know, you can't bring uh, every employee into all these discussions, certainly on the, you know, on the early stages, but uh, as much as you can communicate, as early as you can communicate, uh, goes a long way, and I'm sure is appreciated uh, by your team. <laughs> Scott, uh, in October 2021, Heartland transitioned to an ESOP. Uh, how did the leadership at Heartland decide that an employee stock ownership plan was the best option for the company? We probably started looking at that, uh, I think back in 2018, I started doing some research on it. Um, and we were three separate companies at that time, and in 2019, we created a holding company to, to move in that direction, right? Um, I think it just felt natural for us that that first off, there was nobody within the company that had the wherewithal or the desire to own and have that risk, right? Um, none of the family was uh, was a part of the company too, as well. Um, and so it, it just seemed like we know if we if we sold to an outside source, you know, the name could maybe change. Who knows what's going to happen to our employees, right? And we wanted that legacy of that company to live on. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we started digging into that more. Um, and we, we like it because uh, it gives everybody a piece of ownership um, and, and a lot of education around that too as well, right? You, somebody doesn't really understand what their, what their statement may mean to them, um, but the end goal is to have everybody think like an owner, right? So that must be kind of as you're explaining to your team, some may be familiar with ESOP, some may not, or they look it up, but that doesn't make him an expert on it. And you know, it's like, oh, what's this mean for me and my family and our status in the company? Um, and I think you just hit the nail on the head with, uh, you know, there's lots of variables to it, but it's, hey, you have a stake in this company. You're not just, you know, it's not just transactional. You're just an employee. Uh, you have an ownership stake in this company, and this is beneficial for the company, but also for everyone who works within the company. Right. Exactly. So. Um, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with it, uh, after you finish that uh, transaction, right, and you become an ESOP, there's a trustee that's involved, um, and, and we have to actually have board meetings. I don't know, if, you know, a lot of times you just put those off to the side, right, as a company, but we actually have quarterly board meetings. We have three outside members of our board, and then Scott and I are the two inside members, so technically we could get outvoted on something. Um, but we handpick them, obviously. They're good people, and every meeting that we have seems to get better. Um, and it, it's just, it, let me see, I'll back up here a little bit. So it's, a, it's governed by the Department of Labor, like your 401k plan, right? So it is a qualified retirement plan. Um, 
and uh, those monies are given to them every year. They're given shares proportionately based on their salaries. So the longer you stay, obviously your salary goes up, right, over that time, and then also the longer you stay, the more shares you keep getting and the more rise in those shares. Is every employee part of the ESOP, whether they're in the field or the all, office All staff? management is all part management. of it. Uh, those that are covered under our collective bargain agreement are excluded. Understood. Um, you could uh, put them in if you wanted to. I guess when we looked at it, they already had a great uh, benefit package uh, with the pension that they got, and we looked at this plan as a, as a similar type pension, if you would, uh, that our office folks would be able to have. Great, thank you. Circle back to Cam, uh, how did you prepare and train for your leadership role? Is this, uh, did you, you just walked in one day and uh, got, got anointed the COO? Did you have to work up through the field? How did that process work for you? Yeah, so um, I had a very similar experience that my father did. Um, started out in the warehouse at 11 and then kind of worked summers in it throughout high school and in college. I did have a small stint. I worked for a general contractor in Germany for two years, and then I came back. So I've only really technically had two jobs, uh, besides TJ East and, and a German company. Um, and then I've had the pleasure of being able to work through most every role uh, within TJ Weiss. And so I would say enough to be proficient, not uh, enough to be the best at it. So, you know, that's why you have a great team that picks up and does everything a lot better than you yourself can do. Um, but just, I'll just be honest, uh, uh, until a few years ago, I did, a lot, did my best at listening. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I'm the best at that, but uh, it's always a daily struggle. But trying to listen and learn, better understand the needs of everybody. And then in the last couple of years, um, I have then put more time towards joining different groups um, to really focus on my leadership, my active listening, other things like that. that really trying to flex that muscle mm -hmm. and, and try to be a better leader, manager, whatever it will be. Excellent. Was that a uh, two-year stint for the general contractor? Was that, I say intentional, was, it, was there, uh, or maybe beneficial is a better way to put it, to get experience outside of the family business so you could just see, uh, you know, through a different set of eyes how other companies do things? Yeah, um, I, I, I choose to, to, life will take you in spots and you just, uh, as long as you allow your, yourself to go there. So that was kind of uh, how life took me to Germany. Mm -hmm. But overall, it was one of the best learning experiences for myself. It was uh, a little bit better understanding how a general contractor works, mm -hmm. better understanding how European construction works, and then just having a whole different perspective outside the just family business. So it was invaluable uh, experience for myself. I bet. Excellent. So Tim, I hear you're the founder of the company. 30 years ago, as I mentioned, uh, do you find it difficult to balance you know, slowly stepping back while trying not to chime in on every executive decision? I would imagine you know, your, na your name's on the door. Um, you, want, uh, you want Cameron to, as you said, you know, be Cameron mm -hmm. and not a, uh, Tim uh, 2.0, but mm -hmm. uh, has that been a challenge? Does it still continue to be a challenge to, even if you see something that's not the way maybe you think it should be going to, Maybe bite your tongue once in a while or uh, address it a little differently? It, 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 it was a serious challenge. It's, uh, you know, I, I'd started moving, moving away uh, from, from work and, and, and handing off more to the leadership team and more to Cam. And, uh, and I'd be gone for a while and then come back and I'd be asking questions. You know, I'd come back and ask questions because I'm getting emails. And, and it was frustrating people, leadership team, Cam, you know, it's like, damn it, Dad, we got it, you know. Um, so it came to a conclusion, and I said, well, it's email started this, so I can solve this. So if my name is on the two line on your email, I'm going to get involved. If you guys are just wanting to keep me in the loop mm -hmm. and respect me, put me in the CC. I'm not going to, you know, if I'm in the CC line, I'll read it if I feel like it, but I'm going to let it, you know, I'm going to assume it's taken care of. If it's in the two line, I'm jumping in. And, uh, and so we solved that problem, and then uh, uh, I came, came to the realization that, uh, you know, I can't be half pregnant, um, <laughs> and, I, and I can't, and I can't, and, and I can't 
you know, I'm either all in or I'm all out. So, uh, um, so I decided, uh, you know, I, I met with the leadership team and Cam and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm totally stepping away. You guys got this. Um, and I'm here anytime you want to ask me questions. But I'm, I'm going to work really hard at when I come in, not asking questions about work, um, not, uh, you know, if I come in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you and ask questions about your family, your personal life. I'm going to work hard not asking about work or jobs. And, uh, and for three months, that was tough. You know, those first three months, you know, I spent 40 years as a starter in the game. And now all of a sudden, I don't, I see a crane going up and I don't know who's doing the job. I don't know if we're doing the job. I want to know. I desperately want to know. <laughs> I'm reaching for my phone as I'm driving by and having to remind myself, hey, you said you were going to work on not doing that shit. <laughs> so, it was, it was, that was something, I've got a ton of hobbies, and I've always told people, I can retire, I got a lot of things that keep, occupy my time, and I don't have any problem retiring. Those first three months were a lot more difficult than I thought. After three months, it's pretty cool. There, <laughs> is, there is life after drywall for all y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Mark, we talked about this a little bit, but how were employees involved and informed throughout the succession process? I mean, was it one of those, uh, you know, there's rumors floating around the office that there might be some succession, or, or you know, I said you communicated pretty thoroughly, um, you know, to the extent you can right. with these type of discussions, but how did that go? You, you know, we, we did, as I said earlier, we, we were very upfront and transparent about it. I think his testimony to this is, is the fellow that's taken over our business, we have about a dozen people in our management team at some different level. About one third of those are people that I hired. The rest he's put in place in his eight years with us. And because of that, he gets natural buy-in to it. You know, they, they, don't, they don't work for Mark, they work for, for Bill. And, um, you know, the guys that are left uh, have all taken to him, the fine, you know, some been around over 40 years. They're working for him because he's bringing success. He's doing a good job. They, you lead by example. And uh, that's really helped the buy-in uh, with our people is let him put his own team in there, step back a little bit. You know, I don't want to be the front of everything. I was telling Tim earlier, Walking over here, we're putting some new technology in place for project management. And uh, about two weeks ago, I didn't get invited to the training meeting. That told me volumes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was right, my office is right next door to the conference room, and I thought, I was a little pissed off. And then I thought, no, that's, that's okay, that's good. That, that's, why teach me? I'm gone at the end of the year, so why teach me? So it, it was natural. He, he's putting his own team in. They're following him. When you said Bill has been with the company eight years um, and has been part of this uh, succession plan for, for three years, I think you said. So I would say he's you know, a known quantity. Uh, it wasn't just a, I'm stepping back and here's somebody you know, no one's familiar with, yeah. uh, no one's heard of, who's, who's taken over. Um, you know, and then people just probably have more questions. But again, they, uh, well, he's had a chance to bring out his own people uh, in some areas and uh, folks have gotten a chance to, to know him over a good period of time. So. That probably went a long way. As far as different types of employees and, and how they handle, you know, most people don't like change, uh, right? In any, any business, uh, any fashion, change is, is scary and there's uncertainty. Um, they just want to keep doing what you're doing. But, you know, you had, I'll say, either younger employees or shorter tenure employees. And then, as you said, you've got, you know, 30, 40 year employees. Was there a difference in, I guess, how they felt, how they acted um, when, they were informed of, of the succession that's happening. What I've noticed, you know, the, the, the guys working in the office have been really good. The old timers out in the field, they didn't like it. They were grumbling. They're saying, well, when you leave, we're leaving by God. You know, that's, that's all there is to this. And um, fortunately, there's not too many of those guys left, you know, that have been around 40 plus years. Um, 
And I, you know, are they all talk? We'll, we'll find out. We, we've been trying to, uh, to keep them engaged and uh, keep the carrot out in front of them so, so that there's, there's something to go for and don't make a rash decision. Um, and showing them that there's viability to this business after Mark. And uh, there certainly is. So that hasn't been too bad. It's, it's a handful of guys that we're grumbling. I mean, it would help your ego if you walk out the door and you got to pray to guys behind you, <laughs> yeah. falling you out the door. Maybe not good for, for the business, but uh, well, I could see, you know, your, your superintendent, whoever has been on board 35, 40 years, you know, kind of on the back nine of their career, you know, they don't want to break in a new boss. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm too old to do that. And, uh, but it sounds like you're trying to like, hey, just stay the course and uh, think it yeah. through and do what's best for your family. And, uh, and again, you know, Bill's been there eight years, so uh, hopefully that transitions. Uh, and, and the results speak for themselves. As long as they're doing well in their job, they see the rewards of, of their good work. Uh -huh. um, they're on board. I, I mean, I think it's, I feel pretty good about that now. Outstanding. Going back to Tim and Cameron, you know, as far as uh, employee morale, we've talked a lot about the communication aspect, but, you know, did you have certain strategies, and I don't know, with the consultant or, or otherwise, to maintain employee morale and, and confidence? Uh, you, you guys as well have you know, long-term employees, uh, certainly. Um, of course, you know, Tim's been there since the beginning of the company. Um, but just to get in front of, there will be changes, because Cameron will do his own thing. But, you know, this is still T.J. Weiss, and just to try to alleviate any concerns or morale during this transition. Well, I think the, one of the biggest things in my mind was Cam working out in the field. You know, he graduated from, from Mizzou and then uh, he went over to Demo Huber for two years and then came back and went into the Carpenter Apprentice School and worked through that and he worked out in the field with the tools for four years. So that, that kind of set the pace for, for the transition and um, because the guys out in the field knew him, they worked with him, didn't think he was a wiener <laughs> and, 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 uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it was, that kind of set the table. So, Cam, you can, you can go on from there. Yeah, please, Cam, I address right. right. that. We've identified you aren't a wiener. Yeah, I'm going to get the non-wiener badge. All right. Uh, yeah, I would say for, for me, it's, you know, once again, everybody, um, transition is tough on everybody. And whether you know someone or not, you still, you know, different people still had their doubts. I knew about it, different things, but the only thing to do is just kind of, you know, keep on showing up every day and, and proving um, that you're the right person for the job. Um, you know, I've been in the job for about a year, haven't screwed it up yet, so, whew. Uh, but <laughs> overall, um, it's been nice in the last couple of months to just hear some different people that have come up to my dad and just say, Hey, you know what? I was a little bit nervous at first, you know, Cam, you know, I, I, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, Cam's different from you, but you guys still, you know, pretty much are about the same things, have the same, you know, and I'm seeing that come out and different things like that. So, you know, once again, I, no secret sauce, just keep on being confident in yourself, trust your own judgment, um, and just focus a lot of time on just kind of, you know, building up people. Um, for, for us, it's not just our transition, but our company's going through quite a lot of transition in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And so my main goal is, you know, to be focusing on building up everybody. A lot of, a lot of educating, a lot of training up people, and just kind of building that team up. One thing, transitioning in a family business, it's, and, and I told Cam this from the start, and he, and he took it to heart, you were born with the wrong last name, not the right last name. <laughs> And, and I've seen several companies that were very unsuccessful in transition because the second generation thought that they had the right last name. When I say you had the wrong last name, you're, as, as that second generation, you're always under the microscope. And whatever you're doing, everybody's paying attention. And they're looking to chop you down and they're looking for you to make mistakes and you have to be humble you have to accept that you have to charge in and say I, give me all the dirty work i'll do the, i'll do the nastiest stuff 
you can't you got to check your ego at the door and I, I think that is is a huge part of a transition in a family business yeah my my one is uh, from an early age I kind of he told me this and I kind of understood it so I'm an SOB son of the boss you know <laughs> there's also acronym for it but uh, you know what I always just kind of took it to heart that uh, most people that are SOBs do half the work for twice the re want twice the respect I took it as the other way because there's so many that possibly fall into that category that I'll always try to do twice the work for half the respect but you know that's a credo just get over it but if you can keep that mindset, you'll do well. I would and imagine you, you were a good fun. insulating foreman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. a lot of insulation went up. Well, I imagine that goes a long way too. You <laughs> did, you worked in the warehouse, you worked in the field. Um, so, you know, the rest of your, your colleagues could see that. You didn't just walk in the door, you know, they saw you at the company, you know, picnic, but okay, you walked in the door and were anointed, you know, the heir apparent. It's like, no, you know, you put in your time and, and like mm -hmm. Tim said, did, did some of the, the dirty work, and I would imagine that goes a long way, um, that you were willing to do that, and that was part of the process, uh, as opposed to just, just coming in. So that's, that's great. Scott, we talked about ESOP structure a little bit um, as far as having a, a board, but um, you know, there is, as you mentioned, there, there's, it's very regulated, um, Department of Labor and other things. Can you just uh, you know, hit a little bit on, on the structure of an ESOP and, and how, it, how it's managed? Yeah, you bet. So the first thing uh, that we did is we started interviewing trustees to try to find that right person. Um, and it was much like an interview for somebody you were bringing on your company, right? You wanted them to have that same uh, fit the culture, right? Um, and the, the guy we selected certainly does that, right? Um, fun, atmosphere, work hard, play hard is what we like to say. Um, and then... Um, also on your team would be somebody that does an evaluation of the business. You need somebody on your side, and uh, the trustee needs somebody on their side, right? And you don't share each other's work. Um, when we became um, that holding company, we had, a, you know, we had that transition then, and we had some value uh, at that point in time that we were going off of. Um, we then had to hire an uh, attorney familiar with ERISA rules since this is a qualified plan, right? Um, technically, that attorney represents the company, not you as an individual. So you either had to become comfortable with that or you as a, uh, an individual selling shareholder could go out and get your own too as well. Um, and then you start negotiating your purchase price with that trustee that you brought on board. Um, you know, and he wasn't, he wasn't local, um, so we kind of put a spreadsheet together with certain rules and bullet points, and, and that just kept kind of going back and forth. Um, and once something was uh, solidified in a certain category, then, and then we'd move on to that next one, right? And um, we ended up, um, uh, another group you got to hire is a bank, too, as well, right? Um, our original bank didn't understand ESOPs and, and that transfer. Um, we wanted to get, uh, I'll call it a little bit of a down payment, right? Um, have get a little money in our pocket, and then the rest of it are on uh, shareholder notes that the company owns us, uh, owes us. Um, and that's uncollateralized, really, right? That loan, because I mean, sure, the company is there, but know that as soon as you become an ESOP, your balance sheet flips upside down because now you've got all this debt on the books that is out to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need a bank that understands that. Um, uh, in our area is, is Bankers Trust, and they actually go across the country and do this with ESOPs, right? Um, so we ended up switching, switching banks. Um, we ended up switching bonding companies too as well, because the bonding company still wanted us uh, to have an individual guarantee um, and we would go back to them and say, it's, we're, it's not our company anymore, it's right, it's mm -hmm. everybody's company. Yes, we still manage it, um, but, but that, so that took a little bit to find a new bonding company. It's not that we do that many bonds, but we still needed that. Um, and then, again, after the transition, we had X amount of time within our agreement to find our outside board members. And uh, we selected those and uh, have, a, have a quarterly board meeting um, every year. 
after our accountant gets a preliminary financials done, that goes back to the evaluation company along with some questions and answering session, right, on where's the future, what are you looking at, uh, how was last year, um, and then they come out and they give you an evalu evaluation. Generally, we get that probably late May by the time that comes back, and then we'll, we'll do a, probably like a reveal party. We did that last year, right, because it's kind of exciting, right? You want to see what your shares did and how much they jumped. Wow, so you don't wake up one day and say we're going to be an ESOP by the end of the week. No. It sounds like lots of moving parts, lots of consultants and banks and everybody else, and obviously with the regulatory aspect, which is, which is necessary. But yeah, it, it's uh, this had to have a lot of thought to go into it, uh, to go through, uh, you know, all those, uh, all those hoops, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, that first year you're gonna you're gonna spend some bucks, yeah. right? I don't know if it was six figures, but it was it was close to that to go through all that process. Mm -hmm. And then every year you got that evaluation, you pay your trustee, um, so there's some ongoing expense too as well. All right. When you communicate to the employees, did you bring out, you know, obviously, you know, you and, and uh, Scott Blake and, and your other management were part of that. Did you have, whether a consultant or somebody from the outside also try to articulate to the employees uh, what an ESOP is and, and how it'll benefit them? Yeah, we actually did. We had our trustee. Okay. Um, come in and, and I can't remember if he was in person or if it was uh, remote, right? But um, he came in and did his best at a little PowerPoint and tried to explain it. Um, and it's an ongoing process in education, right? We have a, uh, an ESOP committee that takes care of that communication plus planning these little events and stuff that we do um, and uh, reiterating over and over. Mm -hmm. What it takes. Yeah, of course. When you're onboarding new new employees, you know, on the management side, obviously, uh, uh, yeah, it's an ongoing process to, to yeah. educate. It, it takes, um, you know, our first year was just, you know, we started in October, right? So that's only just a few months, and so our share price reveal really wasn't right. It wasn't. I think it was like four bucks or something like that, right? A share, and it, you know, that's peanuts, right? Um, last year when we did our share reveal, we were, we were pretty lucky. It went up to 20 bucks. Still not great, but that's five times, right? The multiple. Mm -hmm. um, we actually were trying to temper that, right? Saying, don't expect this every year, <laughs> yeah, right? It's going to be 100 <laughs> bucks next time. Right? I know. Um, but anxious to see what it's going to be here in another month or two. It's exciting. As far as transparency, a lot of this probably goes with the regulatory aspect of it. Uh, to make sure there's transparency, uh, transparency and accountability, in the ESOP transition process as you're becoming an ESOP. Um, is that all probably heavily regulated on, you mentioned you know, filings and audits and things of that nature? Yeah, um, going back to the, the negotiation process, right? The, the trustee has to justify why he's paying that price, right? Um, and that's, again, managed by the Department of Labor. And uh, occasionally, you may get a disgruntled employee that thinks that the company was overpaid, the selling shareholders got too much, um, and there could be a lawsuit. Um, there again, it goes back to that education. These shares are given to those folks. Um, and, and so he's always making sure his T's are crossed and the I's dotted, right? No, oh, that's important. I mean, and certainly for your employees, yeah, they, they need that comfort level and faith that, you know, this is uh, well thought out and, uh, and certainly going through all the the regulatory checks and balances, so I'm sure that communication is important. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, with our leadership team, um, we, you know, we put that in place probably just, I don't know, maybe a year or two prior to becoming this, and I think we've truly grown to be governed and managed by that team, right, rather than us individually. So it's been a, it's been a, an interesting, you know, uh, how we morphed into that. Excellent. Mark, going back to you, uh, I think you mentioned Greyhawk has a five-year succession plan. Was that a random number? Was that number uh, specific? Uh, How did you come to five years as opposed to two or ten? You know, um, when, when we first did this, when I bought into the business, FMI helped us structure um, this process, and we're mirroring the same process here for this generation. We figured a five to seven year period is fair. Um, the five year was the minimum that I wanted. I wanted to work five more years. So I said, you can, you can pay the note off before that, which he did. 
but I'm going to be here for five years. That's just what I want in my life, in my career. I want to work five years. So um, I'll quit coming to work after five years. There is still a financial commitment to me beyond that in, in equity that's in the business that he, he's going to pay me off over time, or the company is. In essence, he is. Um, but I can't hang on to, you know, how, how we did this deal is when we started it, I gave him 49% of our business. I kept 51%. That allowed him to take 49% of the profits, pay taxes on it, and, and pay on the note, the purchase note. Now, once the purchase note is gone, then he starts to be able to add money to his capital account. And as he puts money into his capital account, I take a like share out. And that keeps the equity in the business stable all the time so that we're not pulling the rug out from, from anything, whether it's the bank or bonding company. We're keeping the status quo. And, and I'm patient, you know, um, wish nothing but success, but it's self-serving too. If the company is successful going forward, I'm successful. Um, but you, you have to do that. And I've put some things in there to say, look, you got to have some incentive to get me out. So I continue to collect salary and benefits until the day I don't have to sign any personal guarantees for anything. Uh, that's his motivation. I don't even like to do that. It's like take me out January 15th next year. That'd be, that'd be a perfect scenario. But you got to keep him to keep his eye on the ball because he's controlling it. But after this year, he's got 100% of the profit at his disposal to use to retire that. So that's kind of how it works. Incentive to get me out. I love, yeah. I love the phrase, but no, absolutely. Keep his eye on the ball, as you said. Right. Tim, you know, there's a lot of phrases about best laid plans. Was, was there any contingency plan if Cameron came to you and been like, um, I'm not sure this is what I want to do? Even after, you know, that transition plan had started, you know, say five years ago. Did you have a, any sort of backup plan or give that any thought? Officially, no. Um, unofficially, you know, I, I don't, I, I, you know, it, in our area, I've got a lot of windshield time. And I, when I got windshield time, I think. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, the thoughts of an ESOP came out, thoughts, you know, anything, numerous things. Uh, I've, I've seen people go out of business in a, in a, a way that they were able to, uh, to collect their money, uh, all their money due, and, and go out of business while maintaining the appearance that they were still in business. Um, so there, there were alternatives, but uh, none that I, you know, like I said, driving around thinking, uh, okay, what, what, what happens if, but um, no, I, it, the official position was, this is what's going to happen, and damn it, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't have been a fun conversation, I'm guessing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And windshield time, I'm going to write that one down, yeah. too. Uh, that's a new one. And, and Mark, same for you again. We're very well thought out uh, uh, succession plan and, and you know, brought Bill on. But again, things change. Um, did you have some of these other thoughts and contingency plans as well? Well, we did. I mean, we, we have a period that would go out to seven years to accommodate. You know, doing a business transition is easy as long as you're making money. When you quit making money, it gets really tough. So that's important. And you don't know where those mines are hiding. You don't know when they are. I mean, I've been there 42 years, and I've been through two downturns that about ripped my fingernails out. So, you know, if that was happening, this wouldn't be happening. Uh, fortunately, everything's been great during this period, but you got to make money to pull off the plan. And so you got to leave some flexibility in there on the timing of it because, you know, it's history. We're going to have down markets. It's, Bill hasn't faced one yet. I keep telling him. It's, it'll come. Save. Put know. away, brother. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, going to ask you a little different question than we have here, but, um, you know, having been in ESOP for a couple years now, I guess maybe this is hard to answer or one you don't want to answer, but you know, is, has it shown that that was a great move for your particular company? Would you all do it again? Um, do you wish you did it earlier? 
I, I, it's, it's been a great decision, I would say. I, and I think the timing was right for us, too. Um, it was just under 20 years. Um, when we, you know, 20 years in business, we started in 02, and so that felt right. Scott and I have a, a, an older uh, partner. He's 10 years older than us, so he was getting really close to that point. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I guess two things that I didn't mention about the, the benefit of, a, of an ESOP, and one of them is the, the running of the business didn't change, right? We were still all there mm -hmm. in charge, right? And I like to say managing or watching out for our investment, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the key things is as an S Corp ESOP, you do not pay any taxes. So those quarterly you know, payments that your distributions that we as owners always get, the majority of that always goes right to taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Well. We don't have that now. Now, we're paying down on debt. We're using those monies to pay mm -hmm. down on debt. But someday, in theory, I, I keep the, the consultants tell us this, but in theory, you become a cash-based business and you're flush in cash, and then you have to go out and spend it. You gotta, you gotta find somebody to buy. You gotta do this. You gotta do that. Right? Um, again, they tell us that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's it's been great. Awesome, uh, and we may have time for a couple questions here, but just wrapping up, you know, there may be those in the audience, you know, they don't have a, a family member who wants to run the business, what do they do? Um, don't have employees that, that have expressed interest or obvious successors uh, to the business. You know, an ESOP, you know, sounds great in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of work and thought that needs to go into making that decision. You certainly don't want to make that lightly, uh, particularly with the, you know, the investment you have to make on the front end, uh, just to set that up and everything that goes with that. You know, do you sell, a com sell to a competitor or would you never dream of doing such a thing uh, with the company that you've built? Um, you know, what happens to your employees? Would your competitor keep them? All those things that would go into that thought process. So thinking maybe we could go down the line, just, you know, we've talked about a whole lot of different things here, but, uh, and we'll start with you, Scott, you know, if there's kind of advice you'd give to anyone in the audience uh, who's an owner, again, thinking of this, you know, I don't want the company to go away. Uh, how do we uh, have a success or have a plan in place? What steps do we take? Just kind of uh, maybe a nugget uh, you all could leave with them uh, as a word of advice, if you will. You had to start with me, huh? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I guess I would say just think through that process. And ours was, like I say, we wanted to have that legacy of our company. I, I would often joke that, you know, you're in the hot, you're in the in the ambulance. You know it's probably the last bed you're going to lie in, and you pass by a job site with Heartland on it, right? <laughs> I think that would be just just great, right? Um, so we we wanted that, um, and you know it, it, it is a complicated process, uh, but if you work through it, um, it's rewarding too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, I think my. My thing that I've been trying to speak with, you know, friends of my dad's, people that are kind of his age, especially those that have founded a company, um, is to at least start thinking about the uh, relative emotional impact it'll do, that it'll have, because, you know, kind of shepherding your baby, whatever the plan is, um, can be difficult, you know, and I started talking to my dad three to five years about that, just like, hey, you know, just give it some thought, I know it's going to be a little bit harder. He blew it off like most everybody always does. But, you know, after the fact, he just started opening up like, yeah, it was a little harder than I anticipated. You know, there, there's a lot emotionally built up into that, you know. And um, a lot of people, you know, once again, if they're, play, if they're working really hard, some people don't have that many hobbies. So uh, anybody looking at retirement age, get some hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Tim? Um, just tag along with what Cam said. It, it's... Uh, and what I had mentioned earlier, uh, it don't, I, I've got a ton of hobbies. I, it, and I really did underestimate the, the mental part of being in the game every day. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think you can prepare yourself enough. I don't, I don't know how you would prepare for it because it, you know, it, just, it just hits you and all of a sudden you're, you, you know, you go from one day you know everything about every job you got going and 
three weeks later, you have no clue of anything. And you, know, people, and you, and you don't really realize how much your, your work life affects your social life. And when people come up to you and say, hey, how you doing? You guys busy? I don't know. Um, <laughs> how, many, how many guys you got? I don't know. Um, what jobs, what, what big jobs you got going right now? I don't know. Um, you know, it, 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 the first, first few times you say that, you say it just like that. Now I say, I don't know and I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> so it, it, it does get easier, but it, don't underestimate the, the, the mental part of it. Mark, any words of wisdom? Uh, I would say start early. You can't start the process, the thought process, early enough. The execution takes time, but putting the plan together, finding the right individual. Um, and, and, you know, as Scott said, it's really important to me to see Greyhawk flourish into the third generation. That's, that's important. You know, I find great satisfaction if we can make that happen. If you're selling to an insider, there's no insider can come up and write you a check for your business. They, they don't have the wherewithal to do that. So think about that. You have to give them the vehicle to earn the money, and the vehicle is given to them as a reward for their contribution to your success. You have to do that, though. So sometimes it feels like you're paying yourself with your own money. Well, what's the alternative? How are you going to get that out of there? Are you going to sell to venture capital? They'll come in and wreck your business, in my opinion. You know, we're not, we're not a big business. You're not buying a lot. You're buying the efforts of people. So the people in my business understand it, and they appreciate it, and, and they have that same pride. And there couldn't be any better way to pass it off, in my opinion. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think we have time for a question or two. Any questions uh, for our panel? Mr. Casabona? Yeah, so you, you talk a lot about how you manage the, the transition internally with your successors and your employees. How did you man manage it externally with your customers, and how did you transition those relationships? That's a good question. Um, you know, we, we have not made, again, transparency proactively because those customers are asking those same questions. You know, the ownership's getting old over there. Should we do business with them? What are they, are they gonna pull the rug out from underneath us in the middle of a job? They wanna know. They wanna know that you have a plan. They wanna know who that next owner's gonna be and they wanna be comfortable. They ask a lot of questions. And the bigger they are, the more questions they ask. For us, it was first appointing Cam, COO, and, and then getting him involved and, and having him take over some of the duties, the industry-wide duties that I did. And, and then for, for us, it was me, you know, getting him, bringing him along, introducing him to people, and then stepping back and letting, letting that conversation continue on. Um, so once, as C, once he had the COO title, and even though he had the, the wrong last name or the right last name, um, it, it's unbelievable. I, I, people have told me this, and I didn't believe it. The, the consultant even told me this, that um, the respect factor from your customers does not come about until you have the right title. And, and I didn't believe it, but I, I, I watched it in action. People that would kind of blow Cam off at times at an industry function. Once he was COO, now they gave him more, more time. Um, it, it, it's a weird, weird thing, but it does happen. So starting him off with a, with a title, getting him involved, getting him out and involved, then once, once he spread his wings, then he was on his own. And, and that, but I, I did, my, my project managers tell me that when we take them to functions and they say, you know, uh, if we go talk to a VP of a, of a general contractor, they blow us off. But as soon as you walk up, they'll start talking to us and, and they'll, they'll include us in it. And so it is a real phenomenon and 
So, um, and that was, that came from the consultant. He said, first thing, you know, give Cam uh, an officer title, so. Titles do matter sometimes. So they do. Uh, that's, that's, that's important. And, and Scott, you would hit it. It's, it's a little different in your situation because your, your management team didn't change. The, you know, how your business was, was structured or how the ownership was changed, but you probably didn't have to go around to clients too much, or did you? No, no, we didn't. Um, I think we did a little press release, if I remember correctly, just you know, stating mm -hmm. um, since we all stayed in our same positions and yeah. was there, um, it kind of takes that. I look, I look at it as it takes that financial side out of a transition. Mm -hmm. It takes that out. It completes that. Right now, we still have to have the right people to follow us in leadership, um, but you no longer need to worry about where they're going to get the money from. Right. Right. We have time for maybe one more question over there. Rick? I have a question. Um, what helped you come up with the valuation for price on the company? Um, is there a different calculation or is it something that you feel comfortable with? How does that work? We actually used an outside firm to come in and, and value us. And, and that started before I put this plan together that we're doing because I wanted to explore my options. So I had them, um, they will give me so many valuations, like four valuations. So going back 10 or 12 years ago, I started that process because, you know, the people that do that want to take you to market. That's, that's why they're into that deal. And, and some of their stuff I think is a little hokey, to be honest with you. So you got to take that, you know, understand that they're trying to pump your value up, in, in my opinion, sometimes unreasonable. You know, it's probably not as good as they tell you. But that was a good check along the, on the way, and um, it, it more than validated the value of our transaction at the end of the day. Well, thank you for the question. And Mark, Scott, Cameron, and Tim, uh, thank you all for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Uh, AWCI is very grateful for all you do to support your association and your industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please provide your feedback uh, on this session on the mobile app. Uh, thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing everyone during tonight's uh, President's Welcome Reception at 530, which will be out on the cabana deck, which is out outside by the pool. Thank you.